welcome back to the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and today we're going to continue with the story of the Spanish Civil War at sea. As always, the sources I use to prepare this episode can be found in the description below, along with a link to my Patreon, if you like what I do here and would like to help support the show. So, with that said, let's return to the story. In the days immediately following the army uprising on July 18th, 1936, Spain was in a politically chaotic state divided between two factions of the army and its right-wing allies, and the government of the Second Republic and its allies amongst the left-wing, working-class organizations, and the Basque and Catalan separatists. On the mainland, the rebels controlled large parts of the country, mainly the conservative provinces of the north and northwest, the enclave in the south around Seville, Cordoba, and Cadiz. The Spanish colonies in Morocco were dominated by the colonial troops of the Army of Africa and almost entirely behind the rebellion. The exception to this was the tiny outpost of Spanish Guinea. This far-off territory in equatorial West Africa included the island of Fernando Po, where a rebel uprising led by the head of the local military and supported by a powerful local faction of planters and clerics was followed by a Republican counterstroke that took back control of the portion of the colony that lay on the mainland, including the principal harbor of Bata. However, the Republicans chose to use their only major seagoing vessel, steamer, also called the Fernando Po, as a prison ship for their recently defeated rival faction, effectively cutting themselves off from outside aid. And so the situation remained static until October, when an auxiliary vessel of the rebel fleet arrived offshore. This was the armed merchantman Cuidad de Mejon, equipped with 76mm and 101mm artillery, carrying Moroccan troops from the rebel garrison of the Canary Islands. The rebel ship, her crew apparently unaware of the details of the local situation, bombarded and captured the Fernando Po, inflicting casualties amongst their supporters aboard. The embarked troops, or crack Moroccan soldiers, were then put ashore, and with their aid the colony was soon secured for the rebellion. Among the personnel of the Spanish fleet, the rebellion brought into deadly focus a political split between the commanding members of the officer corps, most of whom sympathized with the rebels, and the lower ranks, were solidly behind the Republic and its left-wing allies. The split was exacerbated by the exclusive nature of the Naval Officer Corps, into which promotions of warrant and petty officers to command rank was very rare. When the rebellion became known amongst the sailors, they refused the orders of their higher officers to support the rebellion and took control of the ships at sea, imprisoning or killing the officers. Again, exception can be found to this in the furthermost reaches of Spanish West Africa, where the cruiser Mendez Nunez was on duty in the vicinity of the Guinea colony. Her officers, sensing which way the wind was blowing, refused to back the coup and therefore escaped this fate, although they were put ashore once the ship reached a friendly harbor. The cruiser would make her way back to Cartagena in September by way of Dakar and Malaga, harassing the rebel coast along the way. Both sides began uncoordinated efforts to use the ships under their control to harass enemy shipping, blockade the enemy coasts, and bombard enemy positions within reach of their artillery. The cruiser Mendez Nunez, making her way up the West African coast, came upon a German merchant ship unloading war material in the rebel-controlled port of La Roche. The German ship was compelled to cease unloading and withdraw from Spanish waters by fire from the Mendez Nunez. Despite efforts like this, German aid continued to reach Spain by sea during the Republican blockade in the first weeks of the war. Ships were simply diverted to the Portuguese port of Lisbon, where the right-wing Salazar regime, fearful of a victorious left-wing republic on their border, allowed the cargoes to be unloaded and shipped by rail over the border into rebel-held territory. Almost all the German aid that was given to the rebels during the conflict reached them by this route. The rebels had been unable to gain any of the major seaworthy combat ships of the pre-war fleet. This left them with those few which were immobilized in the facilities of the bases of El Ferrol and Cadiz, which were taken by rebel land forces in the first days of the war, and such minor vessels as were based in the overseas territories. The resulting rebel fleet was unbalanced, consisting principally of one operable battleship, one cruiser, and one destroyer along with some gunboats and patrol vessels. To supplement these meager forces, fishing and merchant vessels were armed and work pushed forward on the incomplete heavy cruisers Canarias and Baleares. These last two vessels, potentially the most formidable and modern in Spanish hands, were captured while nearing completion on the building ways at El Ferrol. The battleship Espana, the cruiser Cervera, and the destroyer Velasco, meanwhile, 
But to sea with volunteer soldiers crewing them in place of the defeated sailors, carried out blockade operations off the Republican-held portions of the northern coast. Most of the Republican fleet was kept in the vicinity of the Straits of Gibraltar, where they stood ready to prevent any rebel attempt to bring the powerful Army of Africa across to the mainland. This colonial force was tens of thousands strong, made up of the best fighting men available to either side, and totally loyal to the rebel generals. Its intervention in force against the divided and disorganized Republicans was likely to decide the issue in the general's favor. In the days immediately following the revolt, many of the Republican ships in the Straits put into the internationalized harbor of Tangiers to take on fuel and supplies. Tangiers was an ideal position from which to try to control the Straits. Battleship Jaime Primero, cruisers Libertad and Miguel de Cervantes, a trio of destroyers and some lesser vessels operated from Tangiers in the days immediately following the revolt, carrying out bombardments of rebel positions at La Línea on the Spanish mainland and at Ceuta, one of the strongholds of the colonial army on the Mediterranean coast of Spanish Morocco. This activity was quickly stifled, however, and the Republican warships were compelled to leave the harbor before the end of the month. The 1924 Treaty of Paris, which had created the international authority governing the strategically located city, forbade any military activity within the borders of its jurisdiction. Pressure was applied chiefly by the British delegation. Its attitude toward the Republican sailors was icy. This was moderated somewhat by the meetings of the captain of the destroyer HMS Whitehall with his counterpart aboard the Spanish survey ship Tofino, on which the officers had remained loyal to the Republic and had retained their command. Various interests of the European naval powers in the issue were joined by those of the Tangiers authorities themselves, who feared the consequences for the city of likely rebel air attacks on the Republican fleet there. What settled the issue, however, was the refusal of the Shell Company to sell oil to what they considered to be a mutinous fleet. A few days after the departure of the ships, submarine C-4, damaged in the straits by rebel planes, resorted to the harbor for repairs and was interned upon arrival. She was eventually returned to the Republicans, but the changed attitude persisted and Tangiers was rendered useless to the Republican naval effort. The Republican ships now tried to obtain fuel on the opposite shore at Gibraltar, where they were received coldly. The attitude of the British to the presence of the Republican vessels was not improved by the consequences of rebel air attack on the fleet while in Gibraltar waters. Bombs hit a British freighter, the Gabel Dries, and fell near others, while fragments from anti-aircraft shells fired by the Loyalist ships fell onto the town, causing widespread alarm. British authorities protested to Franco, who apologized and refrained from further air attacks. Nevertheless, the presence of the Republican warships was not made more welcome by this incident. Very low on fuel, the ships awaited the decision of suppliers ashore to sell them enough to continue their operations against the rebel coast on both sides of the straits. The British government was unwilling to forbid this, left the matter up to the fuel companies. However, they made known their preference for the denial of fuel to the fleet. British concerns here included the aforementioned perception of the rebel fleet as in a state of mutiny, as well as the probability of further combat and damage in Gibraltar's territory. They also feared that providing fuel for the fleet would grant de facto belligerent status to the Republicans in terms of international maritime law. This would give them the right to stop and search the ships of neutrals, including the British, confiscate contraband found aboard. The Republicans were still waiting to be allowed to buy fuel when a Spanish tanker, the Ophir, arrived in Gibraltar. The squadron fueled from her and departed to the still loyal port of Malaga, which was now in the hands of anarchist militia after the defeat of the local rebels. They would operate from here for the time being. The major support base for the Republican fleet at this stage, as it was to remain throughout the conflict, was further back at Cartagena. The ideological split between officers and the lower decks that kept most of the Spanish fleet out of the hands of the rebellion was emblematic of the highly polarized political atmosphere that prevailed at the time not only throughout Spain, but in states all across Eurasia and beyond. The interwar years were a period of transition in terms of political identities and allegiances. The alignments and institutions of the pre-Great War world had been compromised by the catastrophe of 1914. The sense of uncontrollable fatality with which accounts of the descent into the bloodbaths of the war years are filled and a loss of faith in the ruling institution's ability to control the course of international events. The same sense of futility surrounds accounts of the economic collapse of 1929, which, like the war, seemed to constitute a force of nature outside of human control. 
All this indicates a widespread perception that the institutions in which people had believed to be competent to address the issues of the times, in fact had no way of dealing with the problems arising in an industrial society utilizing modern methods of mass organization. New solutions to these problems were gaining in popularity in the early 20th century. New ideologies based on the ideas of class identity and nationalism. During the 20s and 30s, these would stabilize into the conventional political spectrum for the remainder of the 20th century, and in a modified form to the present day. By this I mean the left-right continuum bounded by the radical positions of anarchism and communism on the left, fascism and libertarianism on the right, with more modern positions in the center, which is itself divided between the two wings of the mainstream liberal capitalist parties. As the history of the Spanish conflict demonstrates, the neutral position of the liberal capitalists, such as those governing Great Britain, the United States, and France, was more apparent than real. These powers showed many instances of political, military, and commercial aid for the right-wing cause, while refusing such aid to the left-wing cause, even though this ostensibly spoke for the legal Spanish government, which was resisting an illegal military seizure of power. This affinity for the right-wing cause over the left on the part of the liberal democracies established another persistent feature of the 20th century international order. In practical terms on the war at sea, this bias of the Western democracies first manifested itself, as we have seen, in an unwillingness to allow the Republican fleet to use the harbors and facilities of two strategic points on the straits over which these Western powers had some control, Tangiers and Gibraltar. Some part of this tendency can be attributed to the initial British misperceptions of the nature of the situation. The circumstances of the revolt against the government by the deposed officers was not well known, and many simply regarded the crews as mutineers who had murdered and massacred their officers. This caused many naval officers and European fleets, not only those of the British, to look upon the personnel of the Republican fleet with hostility. Moreover, the fleet in the hands of revolutionary sailors evoked terrifying memories of similar Russian and German episodes that had preceded the downfall of the established orders in those countries. Another not insignificant concern for the British was the possible consequences for their extensive capital investments in Spain, which they felt would probably be lost in the event of a victory by a republic allied with powerful radical leftist organizations. This tendency of the British and other Western powers to favor the rebels over the republicans would persist long after the initial situation had become clear to all. As in other aspects of the Western reaction to the Spanish conflict, fear of communism and revolution lurks in the background. As is usual in times of social strife, the extreme ends of the political spectrum came to dominate the situation in Spain. Rebel and Republican would quickly become almost synonymous with fascist and anarchist or communist. The Spanish Civil War, taking place in a relatively weak nation, became the perfect arena for the sides of the larger civil conflict in European society to experience their first real test of strength since the revolution that had toppled the Tsar. This ideological aspect of the Spanish struggle was to ensure that the unfortunate country would become the first battlefield between these two rival forms of totalitarianism, the one represented by Hitler and the other by Stalin, that arose from the chaos of the post-Versailles European order. This was reflected in the naval war from the start, the first major operation of the war at sea was strongly influenced by this background of wider interests that gave other powers an ideological stake in the Spanish conflict. This operation was undertaken by the rebels in response to their deteriorating position on the mainland. The anarchists, communists, and socialist militias, acting in conjunction with the regular soldiers and paramilitary police forces that had remained loyal to the Republic, were steadily overcoming the resistance of the rebel forces on the mainland. This opposition was becoming stronger as time went on and more and more volunteers rallied to these militias. Though the fascist Falange and the ultra-conservative Carlos militias on the rebel side were also swelling, the situation was fast becoming critical for the generals. The crack colonial troops of the Tercio and the Regulares, cutting edge of the Spanish army, were badly needed to swing the balance in favor of the revolt. Bring them and the rest of the veteran colonial troops across the straits and into the fight was imperative for the survival of the general's cause and probably for them personally. Despite the preponderance of Republican naval strength in the Straits, the rebel generals in the South, now joined by Francisco Franco, a popular hero of the 1920s Rift War, decided to risk a small convoy on the short run between the old Presidio of Ceuta, Morocco, and Algeciras on the southern shores of the mainland. In fact, risks had already been run for this purpose, and some of the small vessels in the hands of the rebels had already run the blockade and brought a few hundred crack soldiers across. 
This trick hole was marginally enhanced by the efforts of three Fokker Trimortar transport planes and a Dornier Val seaplane that had fallen into Rebel hands. In all, the Rebels had 26 planes of various types available in the area to operate against the Republican ships. These were a mixed bag of mostly unsuitable types, the most useful of which were some outmoded Brigade 19 single-engine bombers and Newport NID-52 fighters. Though weakly armed, these planes were used with aggression and an outsized effect on the blockading ships. These relatively inexperienced crews, now lacking skilled leadership, were easily discouraged by air attack. For example, on the 26th, a bombardment of the rebel stronghold of Malia on the Moroccan coast by the Jaime Primero and the Libertad was delayed when the ships were forced to engage in extensive evasive maneuvers by the persistent attacks of three rebel brigade bombers, though these planes carried only very small weapons and scored no hits. So unnerving were these attacks on the ship's crews that they broke radio discipline and broadcast in clear this panic message. Quote, these guys are roasting us. If you don't come to our aid soon, we shall surrender. The entire fleet must come at once. Another air-sea action occurred in the area just off the coast of Gibraltar. A lone rebel plane flying from Ceuta encountered Republican submarine C-3. The rebel plane made a low-level bombing attack, missed the submarine. The C-3 was observed to return fire with her deck guns and then dive. However, a combination of possible bomb damage and faults in her propulsion system soon forced her to return to the surface, where she lay immobilized until she could be towed back to the Laga. The generals were further encouraged to chance the convoy by the support they were beginning to receive from the fascist dictators. This first came in a form of a few dozen dual-use trimotor transport bomber aircraft, specifically German Junkers Ju-52s and Italian Savoia Marchetti SM-81s. These had begun to arrive in Morocco within a week of the uprising, and already embarked on an airlift, the first of its kind in military history, the first weeks of the war. Along with a few Spanish planes, they had been ferrying loads of soldiers into Seville, but the number of men that they could bring over in this way was small. In the so-called Victory Convoy, or Convoy de la Victoria, mounted on the 5th of August, the rebels took advantage of the absence of several Republican ships, which had retired to the harbor of Malaga to refuel, and the assistance of their fascist allies. Italian planes were pulled from the airlift and joined the rebels' own planes in bombing the Republican destroyers that remained in the area and to prevent the intervention of the heavy ships at Malaga, or the few Republican vessels still immobilized in the harbor of Tangiers. He scored hits on the destroyer Lepanto, killing one sailor and wounding five, and the Almirante Valdez, which was hit by a 100-kilogram bomb and was badly damaged. In addition, these rebel planes also hit the British merchantman Midan and the Dutch freighter Zundvik, along with making near misses on the Italian cable-laying vessel Citta de Milano on that same day. Under this cover, the convoy went to sea and steered for Algeciras, just over 25 miles or 40 kilometers to the north. It consisted of four transports sailing in line astern, the Cuidad de Algeciras, the Cuidad de Ceuta, the Arango, and the Benol, a tug which was pressed into service as a troop carrier. These had aboard two and one-half battalions of colonial infantry, a battery of 105 millimeter guns, four heavy mortars, vehicles, signals equipment, as well as 1,200 grenades and more than 2 million rounds of small arms ammunition. These were given a weak escort from the ships that were in the area, including the gunboat Eduardo Dato, armed with four 102mm Vickers guns, the patrol vessel Watkert, with a single 76mm gun, and an old torpedo boat, the T-19, which carried three 47mm guns and three torpedoes. Before long, the Beno was forced to turn back by rough seas. One of the disadvantages that plagued the Republican Navy in the first months of the war was very poor coordination and a very ineffective command structure that badly hampered its ability to deploy its assets intelligently. This is perhaps to be expected of a military which has just overthrown its command structure. In any case, this Republican naval clumsiness came to the convoy's aid. Despite the presence of three more destroyers and two or three cruisers in the area, in addition to the ships bombed earlier that day, only one Republican destroyer only one Republican destroyer, the Alcala Galliano, engaged the convoy. Racing in from the west in response to the bombing of the Lepanto, she had brought the convoy under fire. However, by the time she arrived, the ships were already approaching Algeciras. The destroyer opened up on the transports, but the three escorting vessels engaged her, concentrated fire, along with repeated attacks by rebel and Italian planes. Moreover, 
The menacing presence of the heavy German ships Deutschland at Admiral Scheer in the immediate vicinity of the battle induced them to break off the pursuit. Rebel aircraft harassed her all the way back to Malaga, and her crew suffered 18 killed and 28 wounded. The convoy, with its 3,000 soldiers and a great deal of heavy equipment, made it safely into Algeciras. The action was not quite over, however, as the last escort, the Dato, was mooring in the harbor. She fired on the British destroyer HMS Basilisk, straddling her before realizing their mistake. Thus, of the seven ships engaged by the rebels in the course of this day, four belonged to neutral powers. The Republicans struck back, but too late to prevent the disembarkation of the African army troops. On the morning of the 7th, Republican battleship Jaime Primero, along with the cruiser Libertad and two destroyers, appeared off Punta Carnero, just south of Algeciras, and belatedly bombarded the harbor, setting the Dato ablaze and destroying the Wad Kurt, and inflicting damage over a wide area, as the battleship's gunnery proved to be unpredictable. At the same time, Miguel de Cervantes shelled Cadiz. By retiring from the bombardment, the Jaime Primero and Libertad squadron encountered German Junkers 52s engaged in the airlift operation fired on the planes with their anti-aircraft batteries, so no hits were achieved. This incident determined the Germans to retaliate. On the 13th, the Germans mounted an attack on the battleship as she lay anchored outside of Malaga. This was carried out by two Ju-52s modified to carry bombs, and resulted in a direct hit on the battleship. This caused no important damage, but reinforced the deterrent effect of aircraft on Republican naval initiative. This is also the first aggressive action by the Germans in the Spanish theater, the actions of their aircraft against the Republican Navy gave a new and more sinister aspect to the presence of the heavy units of the German fleet in the area. And that is where I think I will end this episode. So I hope you found some of what I had to say here interesting or useful, and I hope you join me for the next episode of this series, where we'll look at the first operation of Republican initiative during the developing war at sea, the attack on the Balearic Island of Mallorca. Till then, I remain Mark 7, wishing you all the best.